What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Keep It Awesome podcast, the podcast that brings you the most fascinating, interesting, and talented people of central Wisconsin. I've got a great guest for you today. But first, a word from our sponsors. We are brought to you by Scani's Ale House and Eatery. Hey, you guys know that you love their food and they got the greatest beer selection in the area. Make sure to stop on, check them out down in Schofield, Scani's Ale House and Eatery. And we are brought to you by Campbell Haynes Menswear. Guys, up your style game today. That's right. Whether you want to look, just want to look a little better, impress the ladies, whatever you need to do, they've got you covered. Campbell Haynes Men's, Menswear, they will take care of you in downtown Wausau. And we are brought to you by Verve Salon. And we're gonna, that's very significant today. We'll explain that in a second. But Verve Salon, they got everything for, they're all inclusive. So no matter what your hair type or skin color, they've got you covered. Uh, just a number of spa services and salon services, whatever you got, all kinds of stuff. Half of them, I don't even know what they are, but they got so much cool stuff. But uh, make sure to check them out in, in Schofield, it's Verve Salon. And speaking of Verve Salon, I have a very special guest today. I've got Marie Kiefer. Did I pronounce your name, last name correctly? You did, you did. Hey, bonus points for me. I've, I've been known to not pronounce them right because I'm used, I'm used to print where I don't have to worry about that. So, <laughs> well, uh, so Marie, now you've been the owner of Verve Salon since 2009. Is that correct? That is correct. That's amazing. So you've run this successful salon and spa for like 12 years, going on 13 that's really impressive. And I want to talk all about that because I really, I love talking to entrepreneurs and finding out what makes them tick, what's, what's, how they've been successful, all the challenges and stuff like that. Before we do that, I want to talk about aerial yoga because you just had an aerial yoga performance. Tell me all about that. Uh, that was something I always wanted to do since I was a kid, but never had access. Mm -hmm. um, so Croy Kroga downtown had wall yoga. Can you hear my dogs in the background? Is that? I can't, no. Okay, good, perfect. They're deciding to chew on bones right now because that's what <laughs> dogs do. Um, of course. <laughs> so they had wall yoga and then they had gotten the slings for some aerial yoga. Yeah. And um, after they reopened um, pri or post COVID shutdown, uh, they offered mm -hmm. private sessions for aerial, aerial yoga. So I signed up and the instructor is like, would you rather do aerial arts? And I was like, yes, how does that happen? <laughs> so uh they have a studio down in point where they do the aerial arts so they have the taller ceilings you can climb a bit higher and be a bit more brave um and i've been doing it now for almost a year wow and if you would have told me that as a 41 year old i would be learning how to do this i would have laughed at you but um it's been pretty stellar so well i love the adventurous spirit i think i think a lot of times people kind of lose that as they get older and i've been i've been trying to not lose that i know I definitely don't take some of the same risks that I maybe would have like 20 years ago, but um, I really, I, I'm still like, I, I still like to keep active and do interesting things. And so I think it's super cool that, that you did that. Yeah. I think that's um, an opportunity. I, I feel I need to take if I'm gifted with time on this planet, I just need to do things that are exciting and keep mm -hmm. me feeling good and make me try something new and meet new people. So um, anyone that's interested, Croy Kroga, Down in Point, they're fantastic. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I, I know I know so many people that they're really afraid to try new things, and they're afraid because, like, like you know, when you first start anything, you're going to be bad at it, and people get embarrassed about that. And I always think like, there's really no reason to be embarrassed about it because everyone starts. Everyone starts. No one expects people to come in on their first day and be good at something like. Right. I agree 110%. And I was um, planning my TED talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I actually think, I think it's a double edged sword. I think people are afraid of the failure, but I think a lot of people fear success because if you try something new and you work hard and succeed, that means you can probably do anything you want. You just have to do it. Yeah. So, you know, it takes a lot of the excuses out of everything when you realize, mm, I can pretty much do anything I put my mind to mm. within, uh, you know, within a scope of reality. But. Now, when you started this, did you expect that you were going to do an actual performance? Never. How did, Never. They, how did that come about? Did they talk you into it? No, she just asked. She's like, we're going to do a student showcase. Do you want to try? And I was like, sure, why not? 
what was what was that experience like for you like how did you how did it go like before were you super nervous beforehand you know I've done public speaking now for probably 12 years so being in front of people is not nervous energy anymore I've learned to channel that energy and like mm -hmm. put it into something positive but yeah your stomach gets a little queasy and you look in the audience and you're like oh my gosh I know 10 people out there what happens if <laughs> I fall <laughs> It sounded like it went smoothly. Like I didn't watch the whole video, but I watched uh, some of it, and it looked like looked like you had it down pretty well. Yes, and I totally got stuck at the end, and I just was very honest with the audience and said, "This is how you get stuck," and they all laughed. <laughs> nice. And nice. my uh, instructor came and released me, so it was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of guts, like I know people, a lot of people don't give entrepreneurs a lot of credit as much credit as they should get sometimes because it takes a lot of guts to start a business like can you kind of walk through how you got into this industry into the salon spa industry and how you started your own business yeah I was um an art school dropout I got into classes and I looked at the other artists surrounding me and was like I'm never going to be able to support myself doing this so I needed to find another avenue and uh, my aunt Tony, who owned Tony Salon and Spa here in town, mm -hmm. uh, has always been a mentor in my life. And I called her up and I'm like, what do you think about doing hair? And she's like, I think you'd be great at it. So as a 19 year old, I enrolled uh, in cosmetology school. And it was the first thing that I was always on time for. I never slept through my alarms. Uh, my parents were like, who is this person? <laughs> So it was, it was finding that balance of the creativity aspect that I had. And I really like people and I like working with people. So I graduated, I moved to Wausau in 2000 and I started working with my aunt. And shortly after she alluded to the fact that she would want to sell the business. And if I was interested, she would help mentor me in that. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of went through a three-year mentorship program and in 2009, I purchased the salon and spa from her. And then I um, have transformed it into my own version of what she's created. But um, being a small business owner is wonderful. It's taxing, it's tiring, mm -hmm. um, it's so gratifying. It's all of these things in one. Um, and it's terrifying sometimes, you know, like- oh. was, it, was it called Verve back then or did you change the name? Uh, I changed the name in 2010. It was Tony's Salon and Spa. Oh, gotcha. And then what did you, uh, where did the Verve name camp come from? Friends of mine who owned dwellers in town. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So Amy and Jason were going to open a women's section in dwellers. And Amy had wanted to call it Verve, but that didn't pan out. So we were having um, cocktails. I think it was, oh, Kelly's Martini Bar at the time. Oh, <laughs> Not yeah. Malarkey's. <laughs> that takes um, me back <laughs> i know and she and i was pondering names for the business and she's like you should call it verb and i was like what does that mean and it just means to approach things with an energetic flair um, a sense of creativity a sense of fun and i was like i like it and our first logo the v's and verb verb we made them look like shears so it kind of could fit with the aesthetic too and then i was yeah, like that that's sense. super cheesy we're gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah well, what was it? I mean, I, that seems to be your personality, like energetic and approaching things with energy. I, I like that. So yeah. tell me about what the first year on your own was like. Oh, terrifying. It was, I thought I knew it all. And then I realized I really didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it's really hard when you're worried about money. So yeah. I always have compassion when I'm talking to people who talk about maybe their boss who is short with them or things like that. It's really hard to be calm, cool, and collected and smile when you're concerned about money and finances. Mm -hmm. um, so it worked really hard that first year into figuring out how to not have to worry about money as much, like how to make things a little bit more fluid and what we needed to do. So that stress wasn't there. So I didn't relay that onto my team um, because that, that was really hard. So, yeah. Well, it's tough. I and mean, when you take over a new business, you know, you're putting a lot of money into it. Um, you know, you take probably taking out this this big loan, maybe maybe the biggest, you know, money transaction that you've probably made in your life at, up to that point. And 
it's got to be hard not to worry about that. Mm -hmm. It really is. And um, my husband is a great partner in life. And, you know, he was just always like, if you can't afford it, don't buy it. And I'm like, I want to spend, I want all the new stuff. <laughs> and so he really helped to keep me grounded in that. Um, and to look at, you know, how much money did I personally have to bring in doing hair to not only pay myself, but to pay our biggest bill, which was the loan payment. Right. Um, and so it was, it was just strategically looking at um, how the business can operate um, in a creative manner. Cause I didn't take business classes per se. I didn't go to business mm -hmm. school, uh, but um, it, it has worked out and I still look at it that way. So I imagine that mentorship was pretty, pretty helpful because that's, yeah. you know, one of the things that people might not think about is when you, you know, if you get a job, like you'll probably have a boss and there's probably like a training program and, you know, there's people around who have probably done the job before. Maybe you have some mentors, but like for entrepreneurs, like that's not really baked in. Like you have to kind of like go out and find those people most of the time you know, you have to, you have to do all the research yourself or have really good people. And now I think there's more programs today that, that are helpful, but especially even back in 2009, like, I don't think it also had a lot of that kind of stuff. No. And I don't know if you found the same thing, but back then it felt like people wanted to keep their secrets. Oh yeah. It was like, they didn't want to share either. And it was, and that was, that's always so um, disheartening to me because isn't that the point of learning something new so that you can pass it on to someone else? Yeah. So well, plus, uh, you know, I think you learn it better when this is like, they call this the Feynman principle. Like you, you don't really learn something until you can teach it to somebody else. Yes. Yes. I, I believe in that 110%. And so we've had many stylists and spa providers come through our doors that have gone on to doing their own thing. And um, whether I'm sure they didn't learn everything from me, but if there was anything they ever needed to know, I, I wanted them to know I could be a resource for them. Cause yeah. I'm sure they learned a lot from you. Yeah. It's, and I learned a lot from them. Mm -hmm. My, the team that I have curated over the last however many years, some have come, some have stayed, some have gone. Um, I learned something from each and every one of them too. So is there a, there must be a gratifying feeling to have people that you kind of mentored and then watching them start their own businesses. That must be something. Yeah. yeah. And I, at first it was hard and I, I'll be fully transparent. You know, it, it mm -hmm. kind of dings your egos when people leave, it dings your ego a little bit sure. and you're like, they don't like me. They hate me. And, <laughs> and that's not it at all. And it's taken many years to curate that emotional back. <laughs> with it but no to see them thriving and still in the industry is awesome well you know along those lines like what are what are some of the hard, hard lessons that you learned early on as an entrepreneur like what are some things that maybe you weren't prepared for that like now you kind of know better but back then maybe were some rough spots or yeah um it does take a special kind of crazy to want to own your own business and uh, having a team of people surround you, they're not going to think like you and right. they're not, they're not going to love your business as much as you love it. Mm -hmm. So, um, learning just how to better communicate with individuals, like that was a huge learning lesson and that has helped tremendously. So we can create their own path to success because everyone's journey looks different. So, um, yeah, that also was something that uh, that was something that Gary Vaynerchuk said. Someone asked him, like, "Well, how do I get my employees to care about my business the way I do?" And he says, "You're not. Why would you? Why would they? This is your yeah. livelihood. Like, there for them, it's a job. For you, it's like the thing you created. Of course, it's going to be different." Yeah. So I yeah. think yeah. Uh, I think you're I think you're spot on. Like, it's it's like you have to have that realization that they're there for a different reason than you are, and that's okay. And, you know, it's like you just work, you know, it's, it's a transaction and you work together for each of your respective roles, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, because when we all win, we all win. So. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but you were going to say something else. I'm sorry. Oh, and, and also, like, don't mess with the IRS. They're mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, and, they, and they generally don't like to kindly to messing with them. Yeah. Don't mess with them. You won't win. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> I was not smarter than the tax man. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sounds like there's a story there. <laughs> oh, it just just silly things like nothing major where I was like ever facing prison time, but just silly things. They they really don't care. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, so you you've really developed. I know I know you really devote yourself to, you know, being being all inclusive. Uh, being open to people with different hairstyles. I mean, you can see that you have pretty, pretty usually have a pretty funky colored hair yourself. Whether it's, it's usually a different color. I think every time I see you, so you. you're clearly pretty open with all the different, uh, you know, different hairstyles and skin types. Like, you know, is that something you developed over time, or did that was that like day one? This is this is how you showed up. Um, it's day one. It's how I showed up. Um, I. I don't know. I, I've always been a person who didn't understand um, when you judge someone on something they couldn't, they had no choice in, right? Like there's circumstances in life that we don't have a choice on. So I really can't judge someone on that. Um, so I never really understood that. And when I bought the business, I knew we were inclusive and our team knew we were inclusive, but I realized I needed to work harder to let our community know that we are inclusive. You know, no one ever walked in and got judged or turned away. Everyone is offered the same customer yeah. service, whether you're a doctor or you're someone who's saving up every penny to get a haircut, you know? Right. But I think we needed to make the community more aware of that. And we've definitely had a bigger presence in that aspect, um, especially recently. Uh, but I've sat on different boards in the community. Um, we've participated in a lot of different events because without the community, we don't have a business. So I think it's really important mm -hmm. that we support everyone that lives in Wassa in the surrounding area. Including the Keep It Wassa podcast. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's interesting. Like, you know, I wouldn't have really thought, it's not something I really would have thought a lot about until I saw, you know, until we started talking and I saw what you were doing with the salon. I thought, oh yeah, I wonder why more people aren't doing something like that but it's not something you really see a lot of at least around no. here like maybe in bigger cities but yeah and not even in bigger cities i work for an australian company so i travel around and teach a lot and okay. i've had um other stylists reach out to me after seeing what we did um and actually michael who would come in from appleton and barbara with us we were on the daily mail in new york city oh they they found us online and they thought we were what we were doing was really cool and really like forward thinking and i'm like really okay wow. so it, um the hair industry is still very segregated unfortunately um interesting and yeah and it it starts in school and how we're taught and how it all stems from and then it just has broadened from there so yeah i i think the more inclusion and the more accepted acceptance we can all have the better no matter what the avenue is so so you said something i want to i want to circle back to you said that you're going are you going around the it sounds like you're going around the world teaching now <laughs> yeah um i started oh, off goodness. educating with redkin um oh yeah they're big. yeah so i started teaching with them so that was more of like working i, I only know who redkin too. is because i was uh i used to work in the mall and i got, I got to know the uh the gals like across the way from I worked at I ran into the sunglass store and the gals across the way from me at the salon had redkin so I got to know it. that's why that's why I know what that is yes yes so I worked with them for about 12 years um teaching other hairstylists color cut style um I've gotten to work fashion week a couple times in New York done some pretty big events um and then five years ago I um, started teaching for Evo and they're Australian based so Pre-COVID, I got uh, got to go there every year for trainings, nice. um, and then so I've done classes over in Australia. I might be going over to Germany this year, but I do a lot in Canada and the United States right now, currently. So nice. So you got to practice saying "a" after everything, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I have to try and choke down a Caesar on a Sunday instead of a Bloody Mary. It's oh not yeah, <laughs> or maybe some poutine or something. Yeah. <laughs> You can actually get that around here now. Uh, in fact, uh, I promise I'm not trying to, to show for my sponsors, but I know Scani's had it for a while. They had, I was going to say, yeah. Yep. I think one other place might have had it too. I don't remember who, but. I think it was a Great Dane. Oh, yeah. I know you're right. They did have it. Yep. Maybe they still yep. do. I don't know. 
Well, that's cool. I didn't I didn't know that about you. So that's you. You, uh, you are kind of a big deal then. Mm, no, nah, just me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think that's really, I think that's really neat. Like, I didn't know that about you. So super cool. Yeah. What, so what would you say? I mean, you've had a successful business for 12 years now. That's very impressive. Uh, what would you say is the secret to, not the secret, but, you know, what, what are some keys to like running a successful business? Stay flexible mm -hmm. and don't take yourself too seriously. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, I think that's just good life advice. Yeah, I love what I do. And I, when we were shut down for two months, I remember across the country, people were like, I need a haircut. Hairstylists are essential. And I'm like, no, we're not. <laughs> yes, we make you feel good. Yes, we make you look good. But no one is going to die if they get don't get a haircut or their hair color. Like, so I had to step back and look at my business as a whole. And while it's essential to me and my team, mm -hmm. like, globally people would live without haircuts right it would look like hot messes but yeah. we would still be alive <laughs> and yeah, so I I mean, think that must have been a difficult time for you guys and i know when you came back you really uh i think you you were telling me that you had a pretty uh because of the way it was designed the the salon that it was already like kind of socially distanced and yeah. that you were able to kind of step back into that like is is that was that kind of like good luck or <laughs> just you know that you happen to have it set up the way that it would be conducive to a, a COVID situation? Oh, it was such a huge bonus for us liking our privacy. Like we all right. like each other as a team, but we don't want to be on top of each other. Well, a little space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it was very fortunate that we didn't have to remodel or redesign the whole salon to make it work. It was that hard to, I think you were doing it because you guys were doing the masks and everything. Mm -hmm. Was that kind of, did, did it get in the way? Was it kind of hard sometimes or was, did it cause some, uh, did you have to think about things a little differently or how did that work? Yeah, you had to maneuver a little bit or you just had to have a client hold it against the cheek and then oh, you yeah. undo the, the ear thing. Yeah. But, and sense. yeah, and we still, we still wear masks every day oh, in the salon okay. and um, anyone who's unvaccinated, we still request that they wear a mask, not for any judgment for anything, but we can't socially distance. Right. You know, we are so close to our clients every day. Unless you had really long arms. Yeah, I know. <laughs> We've tried everything. Nothing works. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe like those uh where they got those those extender things, uh, the the accordion claws, like <laughs> yeah. the the grab it. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> no. And that's the only reason it's, you know, we're not here to judge anyone's choices or anything. It is just that I don't want our team members to have to be out for two weeks. Right. Due to exposure if they're not vaccinated or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be, it's just to keep our business and our team healthy. So. So how do you, how do you keep up with like the latest in, in hairstyles? And I always um, wonder how that worked too, because I know like, you see some people that look like they haven't changed their hairstyle since the 1980s. And I always think like, well, who are, who are they going to? Like, who are the stylists that are like, so those stylists must still be stuck in the eighties too, right? Some of them. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and some stylists are purely there to um, give their client what they want. Sure. Yeah. Which is everyone. We need people in the industry to do that. Our team is here to give our clients what they need. You know, so it's mm -hmm. it's about asking the right questions and asking why they want to keep their hairstyle the way they have it, mm -hmm. and maybe making those suggestions along the way to break the ice and get them to slowly try right. and change. Um, but I also tell hairdressers if you want your clients to change, you should probably change what's on your head too. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I like change and I like changing my hair, but I also like when people are like, "Oh, your hair is different every time I see you." Because I think that builds a trust with them that I can help them change too if they want right. to. So, well, I got to think like, I mean, I'm sure they're not teaching some of those old styles like in beauty college now, right? So, if you have a 20 year old stylist, they they probably couldn't do the the 1980s poofy bang thing, right? Like, or am I mistaken on that? No, they probably would be like, um, okay, but why do you want to have that on the top of your head? <laughs> Although I guess that's coming back now, like all, all the retro 80s, 80s is retro cool again. 
So yes, yes. Um, mall bangs have not come back yet, so that's okay. Is that what they're called? Yep, mall, mall bangs. bangs. Mm-hmm. Nice, I like that. But mullets are back with a flourish. I have noticed that. Perms are back, so yeah. I don't think I think I think the hockey players. I don't think they ever got rid of mullet. But now I see more people besides hockey players. Yes, it is. It's the new trending thing. Um, you, you also have the wolf cut, which is just another version of a shag. So, wait, what's the wolf cut? Tell me about <laughs> that. It's a shag, so it's like really short layers all around the face, um, and then but length through the back. So, which is also another form of mullet. Shags and oh, mullets that's... are like cousins. So. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I think I can picture it. Mm -hmm. now I'm getting an education today. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've been stuck on the friend's haircut since like, I don't know how long, so maybe I shouldn't talk, right? But I don't think it goes away. I, men's, men's don't change as much, except for no. the mullet. The mullet was, yeah. you know, a special time period, but. The 70s and 80s were great for men because men were, you know, they were using product. They had longer hair. I mean, if you think of all the metal bands. Metal bands, you yeah. Know, mm -hmm. They were. They were aquanetting it to the nth degree. And <laughs> um, in the 70s, the guys had the feathered hair with the mustache. And oh, so, yeah. yeah. So then grunge hit, and yep. everyone's like, ah, Oops. I'm just putting a flannel <laughs> and a beanie on. Screw it. <laughs> yep. That was, that, was my, uh, that was my formative years. Yep. My, my, sister and I, my sister and I were just talking about how, like, not only did you go to the thrift store for your clothes, but you absolutely wanted it to be known that you went to the thrift store. Like you made it, made sure it looked like you went to the thrift store. So it's not like you went to the thrift store and like searched out like the stuff that would blend in with regular clothes. Like you actually searched out stuff that looked very thrift store-esque. Yes. That was the nineties. I know it was the best. It kind of was. All right. Sorry, the dog now wanted to chew the bone right next to me, and that can't happen. So, <laughs> <laughs> so do you get, um, you know, are there like, are there like new styles coming out, or is it is it all rehashes now? Is it all like old styles coming back? Um, it's all got to be pretty much rehashed because there are only certain things that you can do. I think the newest trend we saw was the silver hair. Like everyone wanted silver and gray hair um, because color technology has come so far so we can do that oh yeah so i'm trendy is what you're saying yes you are <laughs> without even trying <laughs> yeah well I, I think it's really cool i know some i know a couple ladies that have like like long flowing gray hair and they just look they look fantastic they're like silver foxes mm -hmm. and yes. I, I i always wonder like why don't more women do that how come they get like the They'll get like that kind of like my grandma used to have the like the 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 curly the perm uh, the silver perm. Yes, with maybe the blue it just rinse. Gets so thin, that's kind of what you have to do. Maybe is that is that the deal there? Uh, sometimes that is the deal, and um, mm -hmm. there was always a stigma that women of a certain age shouldn't have long hair. Um, Interesting. There's so many stigmas on appearance for women in general. You know, from little on, we're told you have to be skinny, you should be pretty, you should, you know, all this, all yeah. that crap that mm -hmm. means nothing. Um, so I think we're having a little bit of a, um, identity freedom, which is nice. Hmm. Do you think the, do you think the 80s come back? Do you think, uh, do you think that's a Stranger Things phenomenon? <laughs> I think they knew it was happening, so they capitalized on it. You think they were, they were riding the wave, they weren't starting. Yes. It could be. Yep. Yep. You know, it's kind of funny because I've had I've had some like Gen Z kids be like, "Oh man, the '80s must have been awesome." I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but you didn't get your ass kicked every day. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> like I saw I saw someone tweeted recently uh, this like video from the '80s, and it, you know, it was like the guys had mullets and uh, the girls had what did you call it? The mall perm? No, the mall. Mall bangs. The mall yeah. bangs. Yeah. The mall bangs. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, someone was like, wow, the 80s must have been awesome. I'm like, yeah, those people you saw in the video probably just got done beating up some poor kid. <laughs> like, like, the 80s were not nice. 
no. Like I know the a, Stranger Things, I know the Stranger Things uh, show makes it look like, <laughs> might make it look like that, but like you don't understand how it used to be. And I know you know, cause you grew up in it yes. just like I did. Not that it was all bad. I mean, I actually don't, you know, I'm not, I don't mean to complain about it. It's not, it's not all ro roses and peaches like uh, some of the younger generations now seem to think. No, but we did have a lot more freedoms than the kids have yeah. now. Oh, that's for sure. Freedoms. Yeah, you know, I, I, I was a little disturbed to read about this like phenomenon of, uh, you know, people from like Germany or the Netherlands and they come here and they let their kids, you know, just do what they would in their own country, you know, let them walk to school on their own or whatever. And then I'm getting arrested for like child neglect. I'm like, come on, is this where we come to? Have you heard anything about that? It just seems crazy to me. It is totally bizarre. And I I think we we just live in a time now where we have access to all the information. Right. Even the information we don't need to have access to. No, I and it scares us. Like, well, a lot of false information. Like, you know, in the 90s, there was that whole uh, satanic childcare scare thing. That was a total fabrication. It was none of it was true, but you know the media picked the national media picked up on it and it became this whole thing like which was really strange and I, I think that's part of what kind of led to the downfalls like stuff like that people get in their imagination and they start imagining the worst when you know most yeah. kids are more in danger of like people relatives like you know divorced like a divorced spouse you know stealing them or something more so than like a stranger I know. I always tell people that I'm like, remember, you're more more likely to be murdered by someone you actually care about than a stranger. <laughs> and they're like, I don't want to think about that. I'm like, well, that's the truth. <laughs> so I was gonna ask. I was gonna ask you. I know that. Uh, I think one of the first times I I spoke with you is, you know, you had because you, your your old location was where they're building the new Aspirus now. Yes. And I know you had had some plans to to move into the River Life building but uh, we know that uh you know had some had some stumbles before it got built and there was some changes and you end up going to Schofield uh what did you uh what did you think about that move was that was that a, that, that must have been a pretty significant moment in your career to be moving you know make a major move like that and to kind of choose a new municipality too yeah it was um things that happened and laid out like as someone who likes adventure and risk Sometimes things don't work out the way you plan it to. Right. Um, so we had a very short time period to find a new location because of the way everything happened. And uh, the Weston location came up and I loved Basil. I was like, that place is amazing. Oh yeah. Uh, and I met with my contractor and I said, can we turn this around in the time that we need to? And he's like, yeah, we can do that. And I was like, okay, let's do it. So it was, it was in the budget, it could be done. Um, and we didn't, we only closed for one day. Wow. And we literally moved our business in six weeks. So. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. I learned a lot. I'm glad we did it that way because I think sometimes the best things happen when you don't have time to overthink it. That's true. You just have, you just have to roll with it. River, the River Life Project, had it all happened, I think it would have been fantastic. It would have been wonderful. Um, but I have to say our business is much better being in Weston than it ever was downtown. Hmm. So more customers, you mean? Yeah. And we have more visibility. We were kind of tucked away before. Oh, yeah, that's true. So I think that helps. And there are also really great salons in the downtown area, you know, like, so it was like, we were one of many versus one of a few out in Weston. So. Oh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking about that today. Like, if, if you had waited like you'd been waiting a long time because even now I don't think there's a building they're still working on that second building that would have the commercial space that you could have been in yeah yeah you probably would have had to move uh you might have moved one way or another anyway I mean you probably would have had to just choose a different location so it's probably best mm -hmm. it worked out that way yeah it really did and and not to lie my husband and I looked at each other and said do we even do it but I was like, um, yeah, I have 11 employees. <laughs> we right. have to do this. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, we have to, I can't not, no, that's just not what 
within my realm of business practice. So right. Now it must have been. Uh, it must have been. There must have been some excitement in being like because River Life. Everyone was talking about it. It was kind of the the hot thing around town. Uh, is that part of why you wanted to to go in there because because it was sort of the the center of attention at the time that uh, you thought it would be a good opportunity? Yeah, we actually um, we had been talking with uh, Newmark Pfeffer, Pfefferly mm-hmm. prior mm-hmm. to it even being really announced as to what was happening. Uh. Um, but I just see so much potential for Wassa, especially the downtown area, that if in any way I could be a part or an instigator or something to make that happen, I was going to try and do that. Um, I still think the downtown is fantastic. And I think the potential is still there. We just have to have the right people in charge of the projects and what's happening. But uh, it was it was fun. The space was going to be gorgeous. Um, I I will probably would probably be in way more debt had we gone oh, yeah, down right. there. So I was like, yeah, it's all right. Um, but yeah, I think the potential is still there. So I'm I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it's a success. But what about the what what about the salon side? Now that you didn't have that in the Wasa part, right? Or am I wrong about that? Uh, we had the spa was upstairs. It was upstairs in the old house. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now it's kind of autonomous and it's its own entity. It's really nice because you can't hear the salon when you're in the spa, so you can just truly really be relaxed. Um, we've got great technicians. We provide great services, and um, it's nice that our clients, if they're just going for a massage, they don't have to walk into a busy, chaotic, frenetic yeah. salon. They can just go into the spa, get their service, be relaxed, and then go home. Do you get a lot of, do you get a lot of people who kind of make a day of it? And they're like, well, I'm going to go get my haircut and then I'm going to get my massage and, and do all the stuff in the salon. Is that, is that pretty common? Uh, I wouldn't say it's common, but it does happen. Okay. Yeah. The most people, it sounds like most people do one or the other. That's what you're yeah. saying. Mm-hmm. okay that's cool we're, we're not we're not in a hugely pampering society here in Wausau hmm. so I think that would be that would be asking a lot for someone on a regular to spend three to four hours to get their hair done to get a massage to get a facial um, most people would feel guilty for doing that around here <laughs> <laughs> yeah I guess uh, it's very it's very working class uh, yep. uh, salt of the earth type of crowd a lot so that makes mm-hmm. sense which is why i love it it's fantastic so i saw something i was i was digging through your facebook uh before oh. and i saw something about nano needling i'm super curious what that is yeah yes um it's a that. it's a tiny little pen that has mm-hmm. um needles on the tip that are um the third of a size of a hair so they're really really like tiny needles that when you run it along the skin it creates these um striations and grooves so um, serums and products can be better absorbed but then the skin has to produce elastin and collagen to heal the mark like you won't ever see the marks the nano needle leaves yeah but your body has to kind of heal itself Hmm. which produces younger looking more refreshed skin so interesting yeah it's really cool it looks like there's no downtime no no downtime yeah Mm -hmm. So the gal, I mean, is is it partially like a treatment for acne? Does it treat that? Yeah, you can definitely treat acne with it. Um, anti-aging, all of that. Um, rosacea, it's really great to help to get that blood flow go- going to heal any contraindications that you have in the skin. Hmm, that's interesting. What is a what is a treatment of that cost? Uh, that's one fifty a session. Okay. Yep, and the nano needling, you get that probably every four months or so so like three times a year okay so i can't just take a hairbrush and rub it up that won't work no. No. you could but i'm not going to guarantee you, you get results. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i feel like uh so you know every so often i end up doing a story on like a new salon or something like that and there are, there's always these new things i haven't heard of like so it sounds like there's always new things that you have to be keeping on top of and learning and how do you how do you sort through that stuff and like determine, well, this, this seems pretty legit. This is, this might seem, this maybe seems a little silly. Like, like how do you differentiate between all those? Uh, 
I have a really great team of really highly mm-hmm. skilled people that will kind of sort through those things. And then I usually go find it and have it done. Uh, so you, you get it done and if, first. And... Yeah. And if it works or it's something that I think um, our community would find value in, then we investigate, okay, how much does it cost? You know, how many services do we have to do to pay for the equipment? How, you know, like, what does it look like in the budget? How do we make that happen? So um, one of our newest purchases, which I'm super excited about is we have um, fully automated massage tables. Mm -hmm. So now we can provide massage or facials or services for anyone. So if you have a hard time stepping up into a massage table, you're in a wheelchair, anything like that, we can provide services now for any physical capability too, so. Oh, interesting. So this like actually helps you get onto the table? Yeah, because it, it goes down to the ground. So no matter your, ground, so you can just lay on it and wow. Yeah. So no matter your mobility, and then we can just raise you up to the height we need you at. So so really uh, circling back to that uh, inclusivity bit. Yep. We want everyone to feel welcome. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. So what it's do you, important. what would you say is the, what's the future of Verve Salon? Like, where do you see it in 10, 20 years? Like, do you see, do you see yourself like expanding or owning, owning more locations and being like the, the Verve Salon guru, or are you pretty happy nope. with where it's at? You're like, this is great. I'm just going to keep doing this. Um, no, I would say within the next five years, I would like to see someone else own Verve Salon and Spa. Really? Someone else that can take it on from me and grow it into something bigger, something better. Um, I would love to see a young hairdresser take that over on um, someone because it has afforded me a lot of financial freedom. It's afforded me a lot of growth personally um, and professionally. So I would love to be able to pass that opportunity on to someone else. Um, and then I would still work for them because I'm not going to quit doing hair ever. So, wow. uh, yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. Like that's a, that seems like a pretty generous thing to do. Mm-hmm. Most people well, in a successful business would want to keep reaping the, the rewards of that. No, I think you start to, um, I don't know if it's not jaded, what would be the right word, but I think you start to um, look at it through a negative lens. Oh, really? You know, I, I, and it's not that I've lost the passion for the business or anything, but I see my young stylists and they have so many great ideas and they've got more energy they've got you know all of this then i'm like why not give them the opportunity to make it better oh, I, I see what you're saying so it sounds like you're saying after a certain amount of time you just start feeling like maybe you get kind of caught in your groove or you kind of get caught in the ways you're doing things and you're not really innovating anymore is that yeah that kind of what you're saying yes yeah i mean there are certain bands still performing we all know and we're like why are you still doing that <laughs> cough cough foo fighters cough cough yeah <laughs> i love but, them but like i haven't liked one of their albums in a long time yeah and i don't ever want to be that yeah that makes sense you know, I, I want i want i love doing hair and i love working with people so i can do that forever but when it comes to the business end of it i don't want to start to look at it like it's um taxing you know right you know, I've noticed from just from being uh, being someone who's covered business for a while now, I've kind of noticed there seems to be like a 10 year, there's there's something that happens around the 10 year mark. And sometimes it's sooner for people, but I've, I've noticed a lot of businesses, like they always tell you like, you know, a lot of businesses fail like in the first year or two. But I've also noticed like there seems to be something about the 10 year mark or around that time where people just kind of get over it. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think that's similar to kind of what you're talking about? Not that you're over it, but like you see, you seem like maybe you're like, I, I want to step down from the running the business side. I want someone else to take that over soon. And I just want to like do the hairstyling part. Yeah, I, I think it, most business owners start it. Well, I shouldn't say most, but I started the business because it was something new mm-hmm. and something exciting to try. And I was like, yeah. why not? Give it a shot. Um, and I feel like there's only so much you can push business. Like, I mean, you can get creative with it, but it's still numbers and it's still payroll and like all of those things. And I'm just like, yeah, I've been there, done that. Um, 
I still love my team. And I, like I said, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon, but I would like to give this opportunity to someone else. That's interesting. Well, I, folks out there are listening and you're into yeah. <laughs> this might be your, this might be your opportunity or it could be coming up soon. I know I keep trying to nudge my team. I'm like, you guys, come on, anytime we can make <laughs> this happen. <laughs> That's really- that's really interesting. Like, so, so it might have to be someone who comes from the outside and they'd probably want to work with you for a while first, huh? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I would want, well, I'm going to have to work for, for them. So right. <laughs> yeah. So you'd want that time. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Marie, this is a really fun episode. I'm glad we got to talk about some, yeah. uh, some entrepreneur tips and just kind of talk about your foyer into, into the hairstyling business and world and, growing a successful business and uh, even now getting to the point where you're almost ready to step down. That's really interesting, at least from the, the business side of it, but yeah, appreciate you being on. And uh, as I know, I say, uh, I make all my guests say, keep it awesome. So keep it awesome, Marie. Keep it awesome. Thanks for having me. Cool. You guys keep it awesome out there too. And we will see you next time.